Hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Smart Grid Seminar. This seminar is sponsored by the Stanford Bits and Wars Initiative. Uh, today our speaker is Professor Ross Bonnick from the University of Texas, Austin, and he's going to talk about the, the Texas blackouts uh, two months ago. So it should be an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I, I would like to everyone that our next seminar is next week next thursday at 2 30. Uh, the speaker will talk about uh, ultra high voltage development in china and the concept of global energy interconnection uh, and also please note that the start time for the last two presentations will be at 3 p.m instead of uh, 2 30 p.m uh, the speakers are as you can tell they are they are in australia so you'll be 8 a.m over there Speaker today, uh, Dr. Ross Bodick is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Texas, Austin. He received his bachelor degrees from the University of Sydney, Australia, and his master and PhD is from UC Berkeley. His research includes optimization of opt economic theory, statistical analysis applied to power systems, and also uh, electrification of, of the transport industry. Uh, he has a book named Apply Optimization, which emphasizes optimization applications in electric power systems. Dr. Body is a fellow of IEEE and the recipient of the 2015 IEEE PES Outstanding Power Engineering Educator Award. Okay, so uh, without further delay, uh, let's join me in welcoming Professor Body. So Ross, uh, you can share your slides. Thank you so much, Chin Wu. And it's a delight to be uh, presenting. Uh, Chin Wu and I were graduate students uh, at Berkeley together. And so I'm absolutely delighted to be uh, presenting. So uh, today I want to uh, talk about our uh, Texas extreme weather. I live uh, at least some of the year in Texas. Uh, we had extreme weather in February, 2021. Uh, it had uh, effects on the electricity system. For those of you who experienced blackouts in California last August, uh, the blackouts in Texas were much more extensive. The rolling blackouts were much more extensive, both geographically and uh, over time. Um, so I want to give some flavor of the severity of that in this talk and also understand what happened and at the end, I want to give some um, perhaps warnings, you might say, of uh, broader uh, implications of, of what went wrong. So first, I'll start with the weather context. And then uh, and that'll lead us to the supply side effects of the weather. But there are demand side effects of the weather as well. So we'll look at that. Uh, and then I'll present a little bit of a, a verbal description of the timeline up to and during the rolling blackouts. Uh, and uh, then we'll cut to the chase of the reason for those uh, outages and the blackouts, uh, the implications for wholesale market prices in uh, Texas, or more precisely, the Electric Reliability Council of Texas region or ERCOT region of Texas. Uh, and then, as I said, I want to talk a little bit about wider relevance uh, even if the market design is different in California or somewhere else, what are, what are perhaps some of the wider relevances? So um, I think probably most of, of the audience, even if they don't know about Texas or know much about Texas, even if they haven't been in Texas, surely know that Texas is best known for relentless high summer temperatures. And there are many days every year above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a normal year. Sometimes we have extremely hot summers where there are many tens of consecutive days above 100 Fahrenheit. Um, and uh, a, a real hot summer has maybe 50 days total above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The highest temperature ever was 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, Furthermore, Texas has had significant population growth, about 1.7% per annum from uh, in the last decade. And I'll come back to that when I talk about the demand side, uh, but I've just uh, put that in there just to understand what's been happening recently in Texas. Correspondingly to that demand growth, uh, 
our summer peak demand has grown on average by about 1% per annum in the last decade or so. The dates are not quite overlapping, but roughly speaking, we've had a demand, peak demand growth of 1% with a population growth of 1.7. So the, popular, the peak demand is now about 75 gigawatts. Um, for the, comparing that to California, California has a peak demand of about 45 or so. Uh, California has a significantly higher population. So Texans are energy hogs, particularly in the summer, because we have a lot of air conditioning. And indeed, most planning for extremes, most of what we do when we think about how are we going to meet electricity demand uh, within ERCOT, within the ERCOT region, has focused on summer. And indeed, until this year, until 2021, ERCOT was summer peaking, meaning there is a peak in the winter and a peak in the summer, but the peak in the summer is the biggest, the bigger of the peak. And indeed, capacity has been tight in some summers, just as last year in California, capacity was tight for different, for different reasons. Um, one thing to observe is that because we face hot summers every year, people know that they need to get ready for hot summers every year and the generation fleet and indeed the whole infrastructure, the whole supply chain is actually well weatherized for these conditions. And we might say that uh, Texas generation or Texas electricity system is well summarized. So I don't mean summarized in that there's a summary, I mean it is well prepared for summer weather. Having said that, occasionally Texas gets very cold. And I've got a list there of years where there was a low temperature record in one or more Texas cities. The lowest temperature ever in Texas was minus 23 Fahrenheit. So that range from minus 23 to plus 130 is a pretty big, pretty big range. That was in 1933. The most recent storm, the one in February 2021, which is the, the topic of, of today, uh, was reported by several media to be uh, so the third worst ever, uh, behind 1989, behind uh, 1899. Now, I'm not sure that um, I'm not sure that uh, that was anything more than a media claim. So it's perhaps an anecdotal statement. But having lived through it, and having lived through the last cold in 2011, I can say that this one was way colder and way longer. Okay. Having said that, extreme cold for some length of time, whether that's a few hours or a day or multiple days, has been a once a decade phenomenon since 1899. So we get it once a decade. Uh, the last time, which was 2011, coincidentally, not coincidentally, 10 years ago, uh, there was a report into uh, the extreme cold, the blackouts that ensued. Uh, the report was by the Federal Energy Regula Regulatory Commission or FERC, and it was actually a joint study between FERC and the North American Electric Reliability Corporation. And they had a bunch of recommendations for weatherization for various political reasons. And if you were to caricature Texas versus California, I would say Texas tends to be laissez-faire, California tends to take regulatory solutions. That's a caricature of both places, I should say but uh, they're both caricatures that have some truth. And the recommendations from 2011 were not made mandatory. With 2020 hindsight or 2021 hindsight perhaps, uh, that might've been a bad idea. Having said that, there's some evidence that some generation asset owners did actually follow the recommendations. Well, some of them did, but as an overall observation, the gas infrastructure, the natural gas infrastructure, about 50% of our capacity is natural gas. The electric, uh, and, and so it's supplied by the natural gas system. Some of the natural gas systems, some of the electric generation system and the water system, all of them had failures. And I think it's fair to say that each of these infrastructures is less weatherized for once a decade events. In other words, I think it's fair to say that we are less winterized than summerized. Turning now to uh, the demand side, and there's a Q&A about whether, uh, weatherization of or insulation of houses, and I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, let me observe that electric demand is affected by low temperature. I'm sure all, uh, everyone on the line, uh, everyone watching understands that, uh, primarily through heaters, such as residential heating particularly. Uh, if you have a gas-fired furnace, uh, 
then there'll be a, an electric blower to blow it around the house. And that might be only a kilowatt consumption. You might have a heat pump if you had installed an efficient form of electric heating, which would be up to several kilowatts. And you might, if you were uh, not wanting to invest much in your heating infrastructure, just default to resistive heating, which might be up to over 10 kilowatts. For each of these, of course, what we'll find is as it gets colder, the duty cycle will increase and the average energy consumption will increase. But here's a very important point that's relevant to our extreme peak. Even if you have heat pumps, when the temperature drops sufficiently, the heat pumps become inefficient and in fact automatically switch to resistive heating. So even if we use a heat pump that has, uh, in many cases, is, is typically very efficient at moving heat into a house, for example, pumping heat into a house, the amount of energy consumed is much smaller than the amount of heat that's transferred. When it gets very cold, and it got very cold in Texas, the heat pump becomes resistive heating. There's been a bunch of new housing stock added in Texas in recent years. Now, uh, return, uh, observing, uh, let me mention the question, the Q&A that came up. There was a question that said, what are the typical insulation levels in homes, businesses? Insulation can help with both summer and winter peaks. Yes, absolutely true. As a general observation, the building regulations in Texas are not as strong as in California. Having said that, as a general observation, newer houses, you could expect that they will just be installed with better insulation. Uh, a very old house, such as my house the, in central Austin that was built in 1907, uh, didn't have much insulation in it when it was built. I've personally added some, but new houses at a matter of course tend to have that. Uh, so we'd expect the thermal performance to be better than in the old houses. And, and since so much new housing stock has been added recently, we might, we might observe that we should expect that thermal performance to be better on average in those new house, houses. But anecdotally, I don't have good statistics on this, but anecdotally, it appears that much of the heating is electric, not clear on whether it was heat pump or resistive. Uh, and it seems that at least some of the new construction was not well insulated, despite one's expectations. Well, the combination of widespread extreme cold and electric heating, including heat pumps switching to resistive heaters, resulted in a record electric demand in February 2021. So I think it's fair to say that the housing stock in Texas is probably not extremely well insulated. And given that we have extremes of temperature, both hot and cold, we could probably observe that it could stand to be better insulated. So what happened? Well, we had a very big peak in February. And what was astonishing about that was that prior to 2021, I observed we've always been a summer peaking region. The summer peak has always been higher than the winter peak. So since 2015, our summer peak has been at least 70 gigawatts and it's currently 75. The winter peaks have been smaller than that and more variable. My bar chart here shows the winter peaks and the top of that chart is at 70. And you can see that recent years have been uh, below and in most cases, well below 70 gigawatts. The only exception is that blue bar for this year. The top of that blue bar is, a, is at 69 gigawatts, which is in fact the peak demand that was served in ERCOT in February. Very soon after that peak demand was served, we had several generator outages and curtailment, and I will describe that in more detail later. But what then happened was that not all the demand could be served. There were estimates of what the peak demand would have been had it been able to be served, and those peak estimates are about 75 gigawatts. In other words, about as high as our summer peak. That red bar shows, the, to the top of that red bar shows where the peak would have been had there not been curtailment, roughly speaking. It's of course an estimate because it was not served. It's an estimated load that would have occurred. And as you can see, that winter peak demand that would have occurred had there not been curtailment was literally off the charts. It was literally far out of expectations. <laughs> 
Well, was it completely out of expectations? We knew that there was going to be extreme cold and the ERCOT system operator. So in California, you have CAISO, the California Independent System Operator. In ERCOT, we have the ERCOT's Independent System Operator. They anticipated it at least by February 8th, and there might have been earlier um, forecasts that there was going to be extreme cold from the 11th to the 16th. And then on, by the 11th, ERCOT was going to anticipate a record winter peak. Uh, a few days later, February 14th, which was the Sunday, going into that Sunday, there had already been more than 20 gigawatts of forced outages, meaning generator failures. I haven't gotten to the bottom of all of the causes. There are some lists of that, and there are some uh, several studies. I'm uh, tangentially part of one that is trying to uh, uh, collate that information and put it all together. But uh, exactly whatever the cause was, some of it might have been cold, there was already about 20 gigawatts of forced outages out of 107 nameplate. Now that nameplate capacity includes wind and solar. We wouldn't be expecting the solar to be at night and we weren't expecting much wind at this time. So uh, that's not literally the total dispatchable capacity. The total dispatchable capacity is, is around about 80 gigawatts. February 14th morning, there was an appeal to the public to conserve, so things were already looking bad, and a concern about the natural gas supply. And as I said, gas fire generation is about 50% of the total supply. So here's a uh, graph over the days. Um, it starts on uh, the day of February the 14th, which was that very cold day. You can see that we hit that peak demand of 69 gigawatts. The demand fell a bit after that, but then very uh, early on, on Monday the 15th, there was further, there had been further outages, and I'll talk about that in, in a few more in the next slides. We found that uh, generation outages then uh, necessitated curtailing of demand because there was insufficient generation capacity to meet the the desired demand. So we hit 69 gigawatts, that's three gigawatts more than the previous record in 2018. And the dashed curve here shows an estimate of what the uncurtailed peak demand would have been. And the peak of that over the days would have been about 75. In fact, due to the uh, uh, supply failures, there were rolling outages. And again, I'll supply them, uh, I'll describe them in a, in a few more uh, moments. Uh, that forced the serve demand down closer to about 50 with an approximately 20 gigawatts of curtailment. So uh, what caused that? Well, just to reiterate, going into the early morning of February 15th, there were further forced outages compared to what had already occurred. In other words, generators were broken. Uh, there was less wind production than expected. Uh, although that turns out to have been a fairly minor uh, part of the whole game, the biggest effect was reduction in thermal capacity due to failures of thermal capacity and reduction in gas supply to natural gas generation. Uh, morning, uh, uh, by about 1.30 in the morning, there was additional generation outages and the rolling blackouts began. And at about 1.30 that morning, I woke up because the power went out at my house. As I said, the uncurtailed demand would have been 75. That would be an annual average growth rate of 4% from 2018, far outstripping the population growth. So in fact, that is really representing not population growth, but truly an unexpectedly high demand because of large amount of heating load, okay? We had about 35 gigawatts of force generator outages and D-rates. So by a D-rate, I mean a generator that had a capacity of 100 megawatts, let's say, could only produce 60 megawatts for some particular reason during a due to a failure. Uh, uh, then there were some generator failures outright, totaling up to about 35 gigawatts and up to about 20 gigawatts of load shed. There were outages in all technologies, nuclear, gas, coal, and wind. And as I already mentioned, 
the gas supply to gas fired generation is also reduced. Now in California's problems last August, uh, California often relies on imports from other regions. And in, its, in that extreme time, there, it was hot throughout the Western United States and the ability to import power into California was limited because everybody else needed the power. And a somewhat analogous situation happened to ERCOT. ERCOT is famously asynchronous with the rest of the US, but has about a gigawatt or so of import capacity on uh, DC, high voltage DC and other asynchronous ties, both to the Eastern interconnection and to Mexico. Uh, as it happens, uh, it might not have been too cold in California, but most of the US experienced cold weather and high electric demand. And in fact, the surrounding regions around ERCOT also had rolling blackouts, uh, meaning that the imports, they were not uh, planning to, they weren't going to export any power to ERCOT because they were already curtailing their own demand. So in fact, during much of the blackout, the imports to ERCOT uh, were reduced. So even if we'd had 10 gigawatts of import capacity, we would not necessarily have been able to import much power. They were rolling blackouts, but here's the rub. The rolling blackouts are not deliberately not imposed on two main classes of consumers. The first is that there are distribution feeders in ERCOT. So distribution is the wire, the wires typically radial that do the last few miles of delivery to uh, consumers. Distribution feeders have so-called under frequency load shed relays. What are they, what is the idea there? The idea is if there were multiple uncontrolled generator outages, the electrical frequency would drop as supply dropped compared to demand, frequency would drop and these under frequency relays would trip. So 25% of ERCOT feeder load is on under frequency relays. That's our last ditch defense against a cascade that would cause a complete system blackout. So we're not gonna uh, impose rolling blackouts on those loads because we need them just in case. Additionally, there are a number of feeders in California and everywhere that have critical load. A good example of that is a hospital. So if you happen to be fed from a a distribution feeder that also fed a hospital or some other critical load, you are not gonna be switched off. It turns out the capabilities or flexibility to switch off the uh, consumers, uh, although there is some additional flexibility in principle, for the most part, it was controlled during this blackout by all or nothing on particular feeders. So if you had a feeder, if you were on a feeder with a hospital, you didn't get blacked out. Unfortunately, the required load shed from ERCOT was so large that many distribution feeders were outaged almost continuously for several days. And again, I haven't gotten to the bottom of this, but I think in cities such as Austin, Houston, and Dallas that have a lot of hospitals, what basically happened was that when you added up the feeder load on under-frequency relays and the feeder load supplying hospitals, loads that were fed on feeders that also fed hospitals, we found that the feeders that were left over represented uh, uh, much less than 50% of the available total load. So many distribution feeders were outaged almost continuously for several days. My own home was blacked out for all but 90 minutes over 59 hours. Uh, I went off, as I said, at about 1.30 a.m. on Monday, it came on briefly at two. I jumped up and switched my gas-fired heater on. Uh, it's, the blower is electrical, so I needed a little bit of electricity. We cranked that as hard as we could because we didn't know how long the electricity was gonna be on. It was only on for a couple of hours. And so then uh, we lost power again. All of the rest of Tuesday, we didn't have power. Power was finally restored Wednesday afternoon. And my house at its lowest temperature went to 43 degrees inside went to 43 degrees. It went as low as 10 degrees outside, by the way. So what caused this? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that it's extreme cold. And we should observe that this is a common mode cause of both the high demand and the failures in the electricity, natural gas and water infrastructure. 
So we have a double whammy here, right? We have a common mode. It's not just causing multiple generator failures. It's not just causing increased demand. It's doing both at the same time. And so that posed a real problem for us. And I think to the extent that uh, heat pump load played in a, a role in this, it probably had a very non-linear effect. In other words, as the temperature dropped, each additional degree of temperature drop meant that more and more heat pumps turned into resistive heaters, jacking up the demand uh, rather more significantly than you might have expected from the heat pump load. So it was very inconvenient. Uh, I hope I've conveyed that it was inconvenient to me. Uh, and there was, uh, uh, but uh, far worse, there was deaths, uh, both directly and indirectly due to the cold. And I would say electricity outages indirectly caused some deaths due to the cold. There were also apparently various interacting issues. So it turns out that to move gas along a gas pipeline, we need to pump the gas, we need to pressurize it. And some of those pumps are natural gas fired. In other words, they use some of the natural gas that is being pumped, but some of them are electrically powered. And it turns out that that infrastructure should have been nominated as critical infrastructure to the transmission distribution companies, but was not. And so some of these compressors, electrically powered compressors were actually interrupted, which further reduced the gas supply. I think it's easy to overstate that. I don't think it happened on a lot of feeders, but it certainly contributed to the reduction in natural gas supply. And let me say this, at least from a public perspective, the relative significance of very specific issues is really not fully clear as of today at least not clear to me and not clear in the public domain. And indeed, uh, there are several things we don't know. We don't know how many generation and other asset owners paid attention to the 2011 recommendations. Some did, some didn't. We need to do some forensics on that. We also don't know whether the things that broke in 2011 was the same equipment that failed this time. So a large thermal generating system, generating station has a large number of pieces of equipment and sensors. In the 2011 blackout, in many cases, it was sensors that failed, uh, which you would think would be relatively inexpensive to weatherize. It's not clear whether the things that failed in 2011 also failed in 2021, or whether they were different things that broke. And furthermore, we don't really know whether the failures of uh, generators or the failures of the natural gas infrastructure was more significant. Although I have to say, it's beginning to appear that the natural gas infrastructure might have been the most important failure. I, I'd state that tentatively because I think we're still waiting for a good deal of, of evidence about that to become public. There are probably various private entities that have a good idea about this. And I have my own private opinions, I should say. But in terms of public information, I think uh, we're still waiting on some of that. So where does that put us? Well, I think it remains true that expectations about annual high temperatures in ERCOT, high demand is sufficient to motivate summarization. Generation asset owners and the electricity system generally has a pretty good handle on what on how to be able to meet high air conditioning demand, which is which drives our ERCOT's peak in the summer. But in contrast, extremely high levels of winter peak has not been really well thought out, uh, either in planning studies. If you look historically at what ERCOT's paid attention to, it's paid attention much more to summer than to winter. That kind of makes sense because the summer peak's so much higher historically. Uh, and similarly, the market participants have not paid so much attention. Even despite the fact that we have occasional low temperatures, uh, they just haven't been sufficient to motivate winterization. And something that should be borne in mind here is that summarization and winterization are somewhat antithetical. If you want to prepare for summer, you typically want your sensors, your, your assets to be able to get rid of heat, to not get too hot in the hot summer weather. If you put a bunch of insulation around it, that might cause it to get too 
uh, to, uh, uh, excuse me, if you, the, on the other hand, if you put a bunch of insulation around it to cope with the winter, you might find that in the summer it gets too hot. So summerization and winterization are somewhat antithetical. And that partially explains why Northern US and Canada, which goes regularly through much colder, more extreme temperatures, is able to have its generation stock handle these colds, okay? These, those sort of cold weather. The issue is in Texas, we're experiencing both extreme heat and extreme cold. Burkhardt is different to most markets, and that's going to have some implications for, has had implications for our prices that came out of this big event. It's a so-called energy-only market, or you might better call it an energy and ancillary services-only market. It's similar to the Australian market, as it happens, and to the Alberta market. But it's quite, it's somewhat different to other markets. And the difference is that capital formation, that is decisions to invest in a new generation asset specifically, and contracting around those assets is on the basis about expectations of occasional high prices when supply is tight, or even when demand is curtailed. Like every other ISO market, including KISO, Urquhart has a short-term forward day ahead market. But the principal difference is that we don't have a mechanism to ensure capacity is built, nor to ensure that that capacity is reliable and available when needed. Nevertheless, that's been enough, I would argue, to get summarization to work. But I'd say apparently, or maybe even obviously not sufficient, for winterization of the gas infrastructure, the electric infrastructure, and the water infrastructure. So as I said, we have no capacity market. Other US ISO markets have either a capacity market, and the idea of a capacity market is the ISO forecasts about three years out, what they think the peak demand would be, and then procures enough generation to get that. Another alternative that applies in California is an obligation on retailers to have contracts to have with generation assets, again, based on something like an ISO forecast of demand out a year or two years. People have argued uh, in the context of ERCOT that, it's, that the problem was our lack of a capacity market. But the problem is, our winter peak in 2000, 2021 was so much higher than anyone would have might have anticipated in retrospect with 2020 hindsight, or these days I call it 2021 hindsight, we might have expected it, but I don't believe a capacity market would have had uh, requirements set high enough to meet this peak. So it's not clear to me that a capacity market would have uh, procured enough generation capacity to comfortably meet the peak. Now, on the other hand, it's also argued that a capacity market is designed to make sure generation is available. It includes penalties for not being available, for not turning up. And that motivates, for example, for a gas-fired generator, that the gas-fired generator agrees to a firm gas supply contract. So a firm gas supply contract with a gas supplier is basically saying, I want the gas, make sure you've got it and make sure you can get it to me. Another thing that it can motivate is a so-called dual fuel capability, where a generator can both be fired on natural gas, but also on distillate, diesel, basically. Having said all that, it's not clear that that would be sufficient for a multi-day extreme event. A dual fuel capability, the tank is likely to be only big enough to survive a few hours. And furthermore, there were multiple firm gas contracts that were curtailed in our big event under force majeure clauses. That is to say, the gas supplier basically reneged on the contract. So it's not clear how one would uh, deal with it, would have dealt with that in a capacity market, and it's not clear that a capacity market would help. When we have scarcity, meaning curtailment, or near-term curtailment situations, the ERCOT wholesale market has another feature which is a little different to KISO, but there are similar uh, uh, 
arrangements in place in PJM, for example, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, the ERCOT wholesale prices are set administratively, automatically, we might say, to high levels when there is scarcity. This is a called operating reserve demand curve. Uh, it replaced previous tolerance of exercise of market power by small market participants under tight supply, which was called the scarcity pricing mechanism. And prices have occasionally risen towards or to the offer cap of $9,000 a megawatt hour. Uh, there is a so-called circuit breaker to change the cap after a threshold. Um, but it's fair to say that when all of this was set up, when this operating reserve demand curve was set up, no one imagined more than a few hours here or there that capacity would be tight or uh, uh, there would be curtailment. So extended contiguous periods at the cap were not contemplated. Unfortunately, that's what happened. We had extended periods at the cap. I see there is another uh, 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 Q&A and uh, it's, it's a really interesting point. Um, it says, Sorry, BS on the insulated sensor crap. Uh, and I would defer to uh, someone who knows some more about uh, uh, sensors um, uh, on that. And I, I fully admit, uh, Terry, that we don't know publicly what was broken this time. And we, we still don't know whether it's the same as uh, uh, what, what was broken last time. You've got another question, Terry, about how does Texas propose to, to deal with a range of wider uh, weather things. Let me, uh, let's answer that at the, at the well, let's discuss that at the end, because I think it's fair to say that there's a lot of uh, proposals on the table and it's not clear exactly what the direction will be. So I mentioned that the um, prices occasionally get very high, but there is a circuit breaker that changes changes the cap. How does that work? Um, the circuit breaker is based on a so-called margin, the accumulated margin between the, the price and the peak or marginal cost. It's meant to uh, allow for enough revenue in the market for a uh, generation asset owners to recover their capital cost, even though the energy prices most of the time only reflect energy costs. Um, that circuit breaker is designed that when enough hours of high prices have accumulated, the uh, offer cap will be lowered to avoid excessive wealth, wealth transfers. Um, it was triggered, but unfortunately it was ineffective. It was triggered because our wholesale prices were at the offer cap for several days during the blackouts and, and enough hours accumulated at high prices that the peaker net margin trigger was triggered. But as I said, it was ineffective since the lower offer cap is based on a large multiple of gas prices. And those gas prices were also, uh, were also quite high. And in fact, ironically, the lower offer cap turned out to be higher than the higher offer cap. So it was not effective. There were pretty large wealth transfers, at least between certain market participants. And indeed, high electricity prices persisted even after the end of the blackouts which uh, in my opinion was just basically a mistake somehow. Uh, this current Texas legislation that's gonna possibly force repricing, although there's been a lot of back and forth about that. Having said that, even though the prices were very high, $9,000 a megawatt hour for basically four or five days, which is about 100 times, uh, 50 times higher than what they typically are in ERCOT, very few end use residential customers were exposed to these prices. Now you might have seen some media reports discussing uh, Gritty customers. Gritty has about a, a few tens of thousands of customers out of a total of 10 million. Um, Gritty and a couple of other retailers have real time rates. They sell energy, they price energy to their retail customers at the real time wholesale price which went to $9,000 a megawatt hour. And so some particular customers that didn't pay attention to Gritty's texts, asking them to conserve or find another retailer ended up with pretty big bills. But as a general rule, very few residential customers went through that. Many uh, commercial industrial customers were at least partly exposed. Uh, many of them in Texas have uh, purchased contracts uh, that are indexed to gas prices and gas prices were quite high. So that uh, would have led them to have fairly elevated 
ultimate costs of purchasing electricity. So who, who lost? There were significant financial losses incurred by, for example, generators with forward positions that had outages or supply limitations. Um, there, if you were a generator, even without a forward contract position, and you uh, had an outage, you forwent the opportunity to sell power at a very high price. So there was significant opportunity costs to, to generators that were out. Uh, retailers that had obligations through fixed tariffs that weren't fully hedged uh, were also uh, 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 lo uh, uh, on the, on the uh, losing end of this. But having said that, rolling blackouts meant that less than the normal amount of electricity was being provided in many cases. Uh, however, at least one, and I think several retailers have gone bankrupt, uh, and consumers that were not hedged. So in particular, some commercial industrial customers that uh, purchased at wholesale or indexed wholesale rates, and those few, relatively few retail customers on, re on real-time wholesale prices. As I said, the price continued to be at the offer cap for two days after the blackouts ended. And I, in my opinion, that's uh, an error in administrative price setting. Uh, there's current controversy over whether to reprice because of the implications for other forward contracts. We've had several bankruptcies already announced. Uh, one uh, retailer, uh, a, a rural cooperative as it happened, has, has declared bankruptcy and there are several others. Uh, there've been multiple resignations and firings, uh, multiple investigations proceeding, multiple bills proceeding at the state level, uh, and we expect further inquiries. Uh, and because of the significant role of gas here, unlike in California, where, for example, the California Energy Commission uh, looks after all energy and the uh, California Public Utility Commission, as I understand it, regulates retail gas as well as electricity. In Texas, we have a very strange situation where electricity comes under one regulator and gas comes under another. And I think a lack of coordination there is something that we probably need to investigate. So is there wider relevance? And I think some of the Q&A will, will explore some different dimensions of wider relevance, but wider climatic relevance. Um, this this uh, extreme cold phenomenon in the Northern Hemisphere is a jet stream phenomenon, as I understand it. I should point out, I'm definitely not a weather or climate change expert, but uh, it does seem to be a um, very, uh, uh, peculiar to the Northern Hemisphere, less likely, less severe, for example, in the Southern Hemisphere, not relevant to the tropics. But uh, having said that, uh, similar analogous effects could happen in the Southern Hemisphere. For example, recent heavy rain, some of you may be aware that there was very heavy rain in Australia, and that was in fact due to a combination of a La Nina and a jet stream. Um, whatever the exact cause, I'll observe to you that common mode phenomena are relevant to tight supply conditions everywhere. So for example, we might have a combination of widespread high temperatures, for example, California and Western US, low wind conditions on the coast, uh, particularly after sundown. If, we, if you didn't get an, after an evening breeze, coastal areas would be hot, air conditioning load would be high throughout the West. Uh, and that again, could be a common mode phenomenon. So my point is whether it's hot or whether it's cold, I think we're particularly concerned about these common mode phenomena, which as a rule have not been very well treated in many reliability studies of the electricity industry. Unfortunately, as observed in a recent EPRI report, impactful weather events, and I'll quote, are increasing in frequency and intensity and geographical expanse and duration. I think it's very likely that some of those are climate change induced, whether the cold event in Texas was climate change, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I, I've had some uh, discussions with some climatologists and they're a little skeptical of that. But of course, we should expect that the hotter weather extremes are related to climate change. And I'll, I'll finish with a couple of observations about the implications. I think it's fair to say that as a society, for example, Texas as a community, uh, is, is finds the, um, that, the, the levels of outages that occur, occurred in February to be unacceptable. In other words, the societal risk tolerance for that sort of common mode phenomenon is lower than the risk tolerant, the apparent risk tolerance and exposure of the market participants. Roughly speaking, you might say that the, 
the market participants are going to prepare for what they think on average is going to be problematic. And that includes summer, but not so much for winter. And to me, that means that if we have these occasional extreme events, we're going to need uh, an important role for regulations and standards to handle such phenomena. These are not new to the electricity industry. There are low voltage ride through requirements that are aimed at making sure that generators stay connected when a common mode issue such as a fault that produces a low voltage occurs on the electricity system. So uh, uh, I think it's very important to think about regulations and standards for this. And uh, a complicating factor, of course, is that we need to uh, track potentially increasing occurrence, increasing probability of such events, not just historical averages. Now, in the case of cold, maybe we should uh, just expect that it's going to happen once a decade, but the summer extremes, it would seem, due to climate change, are going to occur more and more often, and we're certainly going to need to deal with that, with tracking that increased frequency as we think about our tolerance for exposure to the risks of such events. So I'll conclude by saying that extreme weather affected electric demand and supply in Texas. We had extended blackouts that were incredibly disruptive and I think unacceptable to the Texas community. Common mode cold, cold was the common mode cause, I should say, of those multiple failures. Um, and al although that level of cold may not be relevant to California, let's say, may not be relevant to Australia, let's say, might not be relevant to the tropics, let's say, common mode causes are definitely relevant to other regions and we should be uh, concerned and thinking carefully uh, about them. Uh, so with that, I'm just gonna open up the Q&A uh, again, just to have a look at it. Terry's question, uh, when, first observation was, um, uh, BS on the insulated sensor crap. I'd, I'd li definitely like to know more about that. I'm not sure whether uh, this is the, the right forum for that. So I'd like to, to, to uh, perhaps take that offline, but I would like to address uh, Terry, Terry Oliver's question that says, how does Texas propose to deal with a much wider range of weather and extremes arising from climate change? Let, let me say that there still are quite a few officials in Texas who at least affect to uh, be skeptical of climate change. Uh, I think that's changing a lot and has changed a lot. Um, the, um, there are currently quite a few bills in, in place. I think there is going to be some uh, legislation that requires weatherization of critical infrastructure. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned about there, uh, and Terry, I would like to take up this uh, in, about the, the, the sensors. I'd really like to know what, what you know about this. Um, and it's reflected in part in a, in a blog post of mine that, that is entitled, Ready, Let's Not Ready, Fire, Aim. Part of the problem is that we have not got to the bottom of what exactly were the real causes. So I can certainly believe that improved weatherization somewhere is going to be important. And it might be important to improve weatherization in homes, in electricity infrastructure, in gas infrastructure, in water infrastructure. But we really need to understand a little bit better uh, before we start uh, deploying our resources. And one concern I have is that the political process going on at the moment has been um, uh, excited to get on with it, but without, I think, investigating what's really, uh, is what's really needed. So in answer to your question, how does Texas propose to deal? Uh, I, I, I think um, at the moment, um, uh, we're not uh, dealing very well with it. Uh, we're we're uh, not paying attention to the forensics before uh, we make decisions, but I hope that uh, in the course of time we find that those that some of the crazier bills get winnowed out, willow, winnowed out of the uh, of the legislature. Uh, I now turn to a question from uh, Octavi uh, Octavi Seminin. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Aren't lots of utilities increasing their rates today? to cover the losses they incurred during the event. So uh, it's natural that if you were not hedged uh, as an entity and your, uh, uh, that you might, in, might increase your, your rates, uh, 
But for example, I'm an Austin Energy customer, and it turns out that Austin Energy did pretty well weatherize its generation fleet and might have even made a profit from uh, this event. So um, indeed, you can expect people to be uh, perhaps uh, uh, traditional utilities wanting to recover their costs. But bear in mind, uh, some entities uh, didn't lose money. Um, and others that are competitive retailers are not really in a position to uh, uh, recover uh, their losses if they were not fully hedged. Why is that? Because those competitive retailers have tariffs that they published and that they have to stick to. Of course, if I consume more electricity, I'm going to be paying more. Um, but uh, they won't be able to retroactively change those specified rates. Uh, down the track, they might try to uh, increase their prices. But bear in mind, in the competitive retail areas, if retailer A starts to increase its prices, it's going to lose customers to retailer B to some degree. So I think that uh, in a retail restructured world, uh, that puts a, a lot of downward pressure on those retailers and basically forces them to take the losses themselves, which, by the way, is the important incentive in a retail restructured world to get them to hedge against their exposure. So Octav Octavia, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question. Please feel free to, to ask uh, some more if you would, uh, if you'd like, if, if you have a follow up on that. But I'm now going to turn to Travis Nix. Uh, what are the effects of intermittent renewables increasing in percentage of capacity having on ancillary services in moments of crisis where load spikes? So um, there's a couple of, couple of elements of this. One thing to, to think about is we had a large amount of thermal generation that wasn't working. In a future world where we're trying to meet demand without thermals, that's kind of like we were in February. Um, and the difficulty is that some of the time the wind is not going to be blowing very well and it's going to be cloudy. So um, I think what we experienced in February is a, is a wake up call about the implications when we ultimately have much higher levels of renewables and we get climatic weather conditions where the renewables aren't, aren't performing. So of course, as intermittent renewables increase uh, as a percentage, um, we might expect that, and sorry, services increase. And in fact, there is a Texas bill that is wanting to assign the cost of ancillary services caused, so to speak, by renewables to those renewables. And this is a little strange compared to our typical history because in all markets in the US, we currently assign the cost of ancillary services to consumers. Uh, so it's kind of strange to now be saying, okay, we're, we're just gonna pick out one category of generation and we're going to uh, assign the costs of procuring ancillary services to them. That's a Texas bill that's winding its way through the Texas uh, House and Senate at the moment. As it happens, um, it's not clear to me that we're uh, needing currently different, different situation if we get to much, much higher levels of renewables, but at least at current levels, uh, we haven't needed to procure a lot of additional uh, ancillary services. And there's a, a couple of uh, reasons for that. One of them is that the short time scales of frequency regulation services, frequency regulation services, um, it turns out there's been a number of changes in the ERCOT market. And uh, my uh, PhD student, Juan Andrade and I, you could Google uh, Juan Andrade, A-N-D-R-A-D-E, um, uh, looked at the amount of procured uh, frequency regulation uh, over time uh, as we increase the amount of renewables. Well, it turns out that indeed with increasing wind, wind is, the, is still the majority renewable in Texas, um, you need more uh, frequency regulation but there have been a number of changes to the ERCOT market that have more than compensated for the amount of uh, uh, wind. So, um, so that, that's meant that we really have not 
uh, had great increases in, um, we haven't had great increases in the amount of frequency regulation. Now, what other uh, effects might there be? Well, the, the California duck curve, which I hope all of you folks are familiar with, is a phenomenon that's associated with a lot of solar and particularly a lot of renewable, uh, 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 excuse me, a lot of uh, rooftop solar, I should say. And um, the, the, uh, we hitherto have not had that much solar, uh, but more to the point, the solar that we've had is large scale and therefore dispatchable, and therefore the ISO can uh, smooth out its uh, ramps, for example, just by dispatching the solar down. So uh, I would say as a general rule, we have, uh, ERCOT has been able to integrate a remarkable amount of renewable energy without, um, uh, without incurring significantly additional ancillary services costs. Uh, now, there may be a few people that might dispute that a little bit, but that seems, I think that's a, a, a fairly solid observation. We've hitherto had enough thermal capacity that the load following, keeping up with changes in renewables, has been easily done by the thermal capacity. I'll emphasize, though, that as we go to much higher levels of renewables, that's going to be a lot harder, right? So, so not, not clear that we can get that, uh, uh, could stay like that forever. There's a comment, um, heat pumps that use CO2 can operate at quite low temperatures uh, versus heat pumps that use refrigerants uh, such as HFCs. Uh, Ole, uh, uh, I don't dispute that. Um, uh, I'll just observe that there are that commercial heat pumps. Uh, I recently bought a heat pump for uh, my, my house um, and it uh, is, the ones that are commercially available are currently not going to operate down to minus 20 Fahrenheit, um, but certainly conceded that you could redesign it and you could use specialty heat pumps uh, to do that. Um, uh, and if and I, I commend that you have a look at some of the writings of, for example, Amory Lovins, you might look up uh, our uh, uh, conference that I was involved in, uh, in in April, the Austin Electricity Conference. Uh, check out the keynote speech by uh, Amory Lovins, uh, and check out more generally uh, Amory's comments on this. And he he uh, definitely has has made this observation. But uh, commercially available for residences currently, I believe they they've improved in the last twenty years, but they're not uh, necessarily uh, able to deal with. Uh, a 10 Fahrenheit. So um, uh, I'm glad to see Terry's well, asking. We have uh, eight or nine more questions. Maybe it, uh, if you can try to answer five of yes, them. Yes, yeah, let me yeah. get to get get to a couple more. Is there any that yeah. you would particularly like me to to uh, to an, an answer? Um, um, oh, yeah. let, let, let me try a couple here. How should markets think about balancing efficiency versus re resilience? I think this is a really good open, open question. Uh, again, I think I want to emphasize to everybody that we don't really know, uh, at least publicly, what broke. Um, there's increasing uh, feeling that there is, uh, the, the, and I observed this earlier, that the natural gas system was, was problematic there may be particular points where we can very cheaply uh, add a lot of uh, re resilience to the, to, the, to the network just by investing in a little bit of weatherization here or there. So uh, let me observe that markets are only going to think about more or less risk neutral behavior. They're going to think about what is the level of resilience or redundancy that I can justify the cost on the basis of the expected value to me of being able to, for example, sell my energy when supply is tight. And I don't think uh, we can rely on that for, for example, the extreme cold, okay? Someone said, would a heat pump which uses gas as a backup uh, be something to, um, to do? And yeah, I think that would be a, um, a, a, a possibility. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, next time I buy uh, a new air conditioner or a new heat pump, uh, 
I'm definitely going to try and see whether that's a possibility. I think that makes sense. I think part of the problem is that a lot of these consumer products, even though they're quite expensive, you know, they compete on price and being able to provide for the backup situation in uh, extreme may not be uh, their main selling point. And so again, this might be something that needs to be done from a regulatory perspective rather than uh, expect it to, to play well in the marketplace. I'll also mention that from a California perspective, um, I believe that California is intending to be uh, basically only adding houses that are electric only uh, sometime into the future. And so naturally gas backup would not be relevant there. Uh, uh, Carlos Nascimento, Nascimento, excuse me for my poor pronunciation there. Uh, if you have robust smart grid, we will know where uh, is the trouble in the network. Yes, uh, I think, uh, Carlos, it's a good point. And I think um, more broadly, there are some smart grid concepts that could have helped a lot here. So um, I mentioned that feeders stayed off for the whole 60 hours or so because we were not able to more finely control things. Um, one, one technological fix to that, that that would come under the smart grid rubric is um, automated, uh, automatic, uh, or, excuse me, automated remote sectionalization, where you could disconnect the load on, on part of a feeder and connect it to another feeder. That might enable you to modulate things better. Furthermore, as it happens, every retail customer in ERCOT is directly remotely switchable off. They can be disconnected remotely. Um, unfortunately, the bandwidth to do that can only support a few thousand or a few tens of thousands of connections and disconnections a day. It's supposed to, uh, it's, it's intended to facilitate retail choice. Um, I think what we're gonna find is as well as additional remote uh, sectionalization, we will see more, um, uh, more uh, 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 bandwidth to be able to control those meters. Now, uh, um, I'm not sure, Carlos, if you were meaning out on the distribution level or at the transmission and generation level, uh, I think already at the transmission and generation level, we already know where the troubles were. And for example, they were not transmission problems, they were predominantly uh, generation problems. Uh, how much storage, next question is how much storage capacity would have to be implemented in Texas to avoid a, the blackout? So if we say 20 uh, gigawatts times uh, 60 hours, um, we would have needed about uh, uh, 100 and uh, 1200 gigawatt hours. So uh, about a terawatt hour. Um, that uh, comes to a couple of billion, uh, sorry, I think it comes to a couple of trillion dollars. So um, it's probably not, a, not viable. Uh, we need to figure out other ways to do it, okay? Uh, Travis Nick says, is there a max percent capacity that can be filled by renewables before ancillary services start being affected? Well, uh, let me say, uh, Travis, uh, in my earlier comment, I wasn't, I was not saying that the, Wind doesn't contribute to increased uh, ancillary services. Um, but what I was saying was that we had figured out other ways to better utilize at least the frequency regulation ancillary services, at least that part, so that the improvements in the market enabled so much better utilization of the, of the generation capacity providing those ancillary services that we've been able to integrate a huge amount of wind without greatly increasing the procured capacity. But it's true that the increasing wind and indeed the increasing solar tends to, all other things equal, increase the amount of uh, uh, and sorry, services that we need. That's, uh, there's no, no doubt about that. I think the difficulty here in the answer is that as you start to increase additional capacity, it's not so much the ancillary services as defined in ERCOT that will be affected, it's the ability of the market to follow net load ramps, okay? Now in other markets, MISO and KISO, uh, there are already uh, ramping products. So I would say already in both MISO and KISO, uh, 
their the particular mix of renewables and generation uh, and thermal generation means that they've already had to define new ancillary services, right? That means we're, we're defining new things uh, that are affected by the amount of renewables. So depending on how you calculate things, um, you, you, uh, you might observe that, that California uh, might estimate the, the renewable level in California. Uh, something to bear in mind there is that California balancing area now through the the um, uh, throughout it's really throughout the West. So the amount of renewables throughout the West is is much smaller than the amount in California. So I'm I'm not trying to prevaricate here, but I'm observing that uh, it's it's not an on-off issue. It's the more renewables, the more you're going to affect, and at some point you're not going to be able to follow the net load with the action of uh, the market, a five minute by five minute market. Um, and, and you're going to have you're going to need to define new and ancillary services that hasn't happened yet in, in ERCOT and I don't think it'll happen anytime soon in part because we still have a significant gas thermal fleet uh, but once we start to get integration levels that are significantly higher I think we are going to need some uh, additional ancillary services I haven't uh, tried to figure that out specifically. Um, and I, and I, I can't point you to good research that's, that's estimated uh, on that. And one of the reasons why I think it's hard to get a good estimate, the lesson I learned from looking at the frequency regulation material is that very often by changing the market, tweaking the market rules, you can fix what would otherwise appear to be a problem, okay? So it might look like something's going to be a problem next year or in five years time, but if you have a market design that's susceptible of being changed and there are people uh, of goodwill who want to change it to make it work better, that can forestall a lot of these issues. So I put it to you that ERCOT's ability to integrate so much wind, uh, which is truly uh, amazing, in fact, uh, has been in part due to various market design changes. And that's down to ingenuity. And it's uh, hard to predict ingenuity. Okay, uh, are hospitals in Texas required to have backup generating systems? Yes, uh, essentially all hospitals, I don't know exactly the requirements, but every hospital that I've been to in, in Texas has a backup generator in their parking lot or somewhere around. Um, um, the, the thing is, you wouldn't typically want to rely on that. Okay, so the backup generator is if the hospital gets outaged. I wouldn't want to deliberately outage the hospital because that would be kind of a scary thing to do. But here's, a, here's another uh, uh, thing, uh, a place where, where I think your point is a, is a better one or perhaps more relevant. There's a supermarket here in Texas, it's called HEB. And it turns out that they have backup generators because uh, if there's a, a, black, a blackout, their fridges will warm up and they will lose all their produce. So I think they are a, a really good candidate. They have backup generators. They need backup generators anyway. And in tight supply conditions, they can switch on those generators. And so I think that's, that's a, perhaps a better example where, you know what, if they got interrupted, they'd still be running their generator. And if the generator failed, it would hurt their produce, but it wouldn't kill people, right? So I think that that's a better example of where um, the additional flexibility can come, can come in, okay? Um, there's one, one more. One there's, last one, there's one more, it says, uh, uh, comment, uh, it's from Carl Lennox. The Texas legislative bill is not allocating ancillary costs caused by renewables. It allocates all ancillary costs, as I understand it. Uh, and, and I guess that means all of them to uh, renewables, right? This is inconsistent with basic principles of cost causation because the level of AS needed is a function of the overall system architecture and generation mix, and there's no fair way to allocate cost back. It's, that's what I've heard. So um, the bill is, is very limited. It, there's just one sentence, and I, I don't have it in front of me, but I thought that it was uh, specific to uh, uh, renewables, but I, it might have changed since I last looked at it. 
let me say this. I think it's a very ill-advised bill. So I, 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 essentially, no matter what's in it, I think it's going to be a very ill-advised uh, Ill, Ill uh, bill. Um, whether, uh, whether it tries to identify what's caused by renewables or, or otherwise just allocates everything to renewables, I think this is not going to lead to um, more efficient outcomes. But perhaps more to the point, it's not addressing the fundamental causation of our blackout in February, which is apparently what's motivated all of the bills that are running around in the state. So I just don't see it as relevant to the issue at hand, which is how do we deal with the next cold event? So with that, I think that's the last uh, uh, question. Yeah. Uh, I, that was a, a great set of great set of questions. I hope I gave some reasonable answers. If anybody wants to uh, challenge me on anything, and I, I certainly uh, appreciate the correction on the, the weatherization of the sensors, uh, please, uh, get in contact with me because I'd, I'd, I'd love to carry on this conversation uh, further. Ross, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. And, it's uh, my pleasure. Yeah. So, I, I, yeah, I guess if, if, the, if the audience have any more questions, they can send you an email. That'd be delightful. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, with, with that, um, I'm, uh, 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 there are no more questions and I'm all talked out. Uh, uh, thanks very much for inviting me, Chimu. I really enjoyed sure. uh, presenting this. Uh, I wish I could get back to live presentations because I'd sure like to see the faces uh, of uh, uh, folks uh, uh, asking the questions and see whether they're smiling or frowning uh, when I answer. Uh, and uh, uh, but uh, maybe that's next year. Yeah, uh, I'm sure we'll see you in a very near future. Super. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you very much again. Okay. My pleasure. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for coming along.